we're here today to protest against the largest pig planning application in the UK for a pig factory with 2,700 sows that has the potential to produce 81,000 pigs per year and over 66,000 tonnes of, of slurry. That's equivalent to 723,000 adults, human sewage, and our, our town's only got about 23,000 people in it. So this is a huge impact on us, on our environment. Northern Ireland is being inundated with planning applications for factory pig farms and their associated anaerobic digesters. Local people are protesting because existing animal factories are sickening local residents, are polluting natural habitats and are destroying local economies. We don't want 66,000 tonnes of shit every year. An additional 60,000 tonnes coming from a pig factory would finish this river. The main things that come out are allergens, bacteria, fungi, viruses. We know that from previous factory farms that have been studied. Some environmental disaster will befall us. There is a strategy that we know called the Going for Growth strategy, and a very senior figure um, involved in that strategy said that they would be quite content if the numbers of farms reduced in Northern Ireland from 25,000 to 6,000. I nearly fell off my chair when I read that. The people that are behind this and, and other pig factories are not farmers. They're not farmers, they're going on to farmers' lands, yes, and paying off farmers. But they're not farmers themselves, like, they're, they're businessmen. Heaven help us, what have they done? A few years ago, we were presented, we weren't asked, we were presented with this strategy that would absolutely and fundamentally reshape the rural environment in Northern Ireland. It's called Going for Growth. And it's a strategy to change the landscape, but also to change the dynamics within rural communities from family farms to intensive globalised agriculture. Going for Growth is, is about s sustaining um, the agricultural industry in Northern Ireland. It is about um, ensuring that, that we can get out there and, and, and market our products and um, create jobs in, in rural areas. So they actually had written that there would be 53,000 sows uh, in Northern Ireland. That then would equate to 1.3 million pigs for slaughter, again, per year. And that equates to 1.1 million tonnes of slurry per year. The elected representatives there don't have an appreciation of the environment. They still think it's something to exploit and to make money from. Uh, jobs comes before the long-term health of the people. The numbers are quite phenomenal. The amount of slurry that produced is the equivalent of 12 million people and a population of 1.8 million. At the JMW Limited factory farm at Ballyclare, a neighbour had tried to complain to the management. It's not a farm as such as it is. It's a, it's a factory or pig concentration camp, if you like. They wouldn't talk to us. I, mean, I have had the, the door slammed in my face when I went to talk to them about, about issues. The owners of the JMW farm, Jim and Mark White, refused our request for an interview. They're also directors of Crockway Farms Limited in Somerset, where animal welfare campaigners Viva exposed the squalid conditions in which the pigs were kept. We're willing to put up with some smell and some slurry. We've tried to have a barbecue and then halfway through the barbecue, the smell has been vented and we've had to go back in again. We can't leave windows open. We can't leave the door open on hot days because the smell comes in. If we leave clothing outside on the line, pig smell saturates everything. We have to bring everything in. Locals have united against JMW Farms' request to enlarge this Ballyclare pig factory. A few miles down the road at Monkstown is another large-scale pig factory owned by local farmer Stephen Hall. He has recently been given planning permission and has started building a new pig factory and anaerobic digester a couple of miles up the hill at Newtown Abbey. I can hold my head high and say I fought against this. There's individuals there who should hold their head in shame. But so I think that while the general public's objection is primarily about smell, they really do need to understand the potential toxic effect. There are going to be a number of ways it's going to impact on 
the local population, which is appreciable. There are going to be irritants and allergens, gases like ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. Sensitive receptors have been defined as anybody living within 250 meters of, of where this slurry is spread. Um, they're going to be impacted upon as well with nuisance, but also I think because um, it will lead in the population to an increase in um, antibiotic resistant bacteria. I was an objector on behalf of constituents. I'm also a personal objector, as it were, in that I suffer the effects of the existing farm uh, day in and day out. When it came to the planning application for the factory farm, there were 250,000 people online who said no, they didn't want it. And there were over a thousand letters written by local residents who said, which is higher than any objections to anything else in the Newton Abbey area, said, we absolutely don't want it. And one person said, oh yeah, this is a great idea. And we were utterly shocked that that level of numbers wasn't considered. If there is evidence that a facility, doesn't matter what kind of facility, whether it's an agricultural facility or otherwise, will have a negative impact upon an individual's health. That's an issue which, which will be taken into account in terms of the planning process and will very often lead to refusal. Though the recommended distance between an animal factory and a private residence is 250 metres, Dr Debbie Turner, an occupational health specialist, lives only 150 metres from the site. Many objectors don't believe that health issues will be taken into account and her objection was ignored. I quote part of her objection. Of huge concern to me is the spread of disease from pigs to humans because of their close genetic links to human DNA. High risk populations like the very young, the elderly, pregnant women and the immunocompromised are all at very real risk of long term health problems. She goes on. The assertion in the applicant's report that the proposal will not cause demonstrable harm to human health is in no way substantiated or supported by any proper research. The pig farm is a huge massive factory um, that's going to contain thousands of pigs who are going to be just basically kept in a confined space. Most of them will go to China. It's going to have an impact for me personally with uh, my son Logan, who's the youngest of my children. He has um, chronic lung condition and he also is on the autistic spectrum and has sensory processing disorder. On walking Logan to school, when he used to go to the primary school, he would have vomited on the way to school because the senses were just overloaded with the smell from the smaller pig farm, which is below this one. And considering how much more slurry is going to be needed to be spread out in fields surrounding my home, I would be concerned about that. My name is Giza Stadt and I worked uh, as a vet on uh, pig farms. Usually would have burning eyes from the ammonium and in the evenings very often I would have migraines. So your eyes burn and uh, you don't feel well. I mean it's no wonder that then the lungs and the eyes and whatever of the pigs get damaged and that they get infections and that uh, you then have to treat them with antibiotics. Any child roaming around in this sort of area is potentially going to ingest antibiotic resistant bacteria. Modern medicine relies on the use of antibiotics and of course if they don't work then it can lead to prolonged illness or even you know in the worst case to, to, to death and we're beginning to see that with bacterial resistance. In Denmark the overuse of antibiotics in factory pig farms has led to a dangerous rise in human infections caused by the antibiotic resistant superbug, MRSA. We know that we have to reduce our antibiotic use. We have used too many antibiotics for many years. So yes, we should have done, done this sooner and it would have been easier to contain, for instance, the MRSA problem if we had done so. The fact is that all countries with a big pig production have this problem. They just don't know exactly how big it is. A US report showed that flies can spread bacteria several miles from pig farms to neighboring people. Another, another health issue is with, with the flies, which are, are landing on, on the pig slurry, uh, and then they're coming across to our house and, uh, and landing on items of food. Then we've had to put um, fly paper up on the kitchen ceiling, and we could have as many as four or five 
rolls of fly paper hanging down. I was embarrassed by the smell, you know, if people would, would come to call, if you left your windows open at all, your house was full of flies. And my daughter was terrified of, of flies. And there were times at night when a fly would have gotten into her room and she'd wake up screaming because a fly was um, one of these big, massive flies was buzzing around her bed. The local primary schools, shops, and one hospital are all less than two miles from pig factory units. I am a father and I am a son. I've learned what I can and I'm passing it on. Heaven help us, what have they done? From the very beginning, when this going for good strategy was initiated, they compromised themselves by not complying with domestic and with European laws. And I say that because the Going for Growth Strategy is a planner programme which is defined under the European Union directives as requiring a strategic environmental assessment. This would look at all the different alternatives, it would look at all the emissions. We didn't have a strategic environmental assessment in Going for Growth because Going for Growth was um, a project being driven by the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Industry at that stage. So I then started to ask well, who approved the Going for Growth programme? So I asked our elective representatives and they have never seen it. It didn't come into the Assembly, it wasn't adopted by the Assembly. So again, we're asking, well, who, who said it was OK to adopt this? And worse still, who said it was OK to implement it? We have a separate department, um, which is now here, but was the Department of Environment. The regulation is extensive, that exists, but we do not have light touch regulation. We have extensive regulation when it comes to many of the environmental issues. However, objectors and conservationists point to widespread failure to enforce environmental protection regulations in Northern Ireland. So we have this cascade of systemic maladministration from the day in which this process was initiated. And we're seeing the consequences now with a polluted countryside for the Water Framework Directive, for the Habitats Directive, the Birds Directive, for these protected sites. These are all being compromised by this development. The Going for Growth strategy was launched in 2013 and has almost reached its target of 53,000 sows. The basic problem with effluent is either silage effluent or slurry is the, the most basic thing it does is remove oxygen from the water. Fish can't survive if there's no oxygen. I've seen dead fish in the river, yeah. We've had pollution incidents. If these factories do get to go ahead and keep spreading and spreading, my grandchildren will never even know what a, what a salmon looked like. Go, going for growth will ensure that you have an efficient industry. You know, we are in a global market, so uh, we do have to be competitive. It will look to, to create more efficient farming and as a consequence of that, it'll, it'll lead to, to larger units, larger pig herds, larger uh, dairy herds and so forth, uh, a greater concentration of, of animals on, on one farm. If we think of the conditions in which these animals are reared, the, the sterile conditions, the concrete slatted floors, the lack of bedding, the lack of enrichment material, the semi-darkness in which they live, and the stench of the gases that are coming up from the slurry pit underneath. That is what these pigs are condemned to for their short lives. I would say to the consumer uh, that this going for growth strategy is an horrendous uh, opportunity for big business from America, from venture capital trusts in London, who are coming in and exploiting what is here. This going for growth strategy is bringing us all down to the lowest common denominator of agriculture to produce that I wouldn't be prepared to eat and I wouldn't want any of my family to eat either. As we walk through this wet field, there should have been snipe, there should be lapwings buzzing and curlews in the background. They were all here when I moved here 30 years ago. In the 1980s, these habitats, these wet margins, they were rich. They were teeming with birds like curlews and snipe and lapwings. We had over a thousand pairs of curlews in Northern Ireland. Now we have about 40. It's considered to be the next species to become extinct. There were hundreds of corncrakes. They are extinct, they've gone. What's done it is man's head on greed and grab attitude to the environment. We pollute our waters, 
we let all the effluent from too many cows and too many pigs, as if it doesn't matter about future generations. I sat on the planning committee until I learnt of this size and scale of a factory and I removed myself as soon as possible from the decision making process so I could work with those who object. And my worry is they've got planned permission for 15,000. How's the council going to turn them down if he comes back in five years time and goes, I want another couple of sheds, I want another anaerobic digester there. And then of course the exploitation of the poor application of the laws becomes an absolute bonanza for the uh, applicants because the one thing the people putting in the planning applications have on their side is the best brains, the best expertise in how to weave their way through dysfunctional government departments where one department doesn't talk to another and in fact I believe at times they don't even understand the laws. We also have serious problems where there's potential conflicts of interest where no one particularly cares if someone happens to be a consultant wearing one hat and then a director of a, a large firm that may benefit uh, profit-wise from the outcomes of the project. We're a very small society and you know we haven't exactly ruled out cartels and all those sort of things that, and that would now be outlawed everywhere else. They, they still work and I'm watching myself here legally because they're quite trigger happy in that respect. It's factory-like, it is not a farm. If it had said factory, you wouldn't have got plan permission. It's too close to the housing. The building itself is in the wrong place. You can see at the side of it, there's a, a generator. That generator was meant to be behind that building to actually cushion that noise from these residents. So there's a number of things like that there that are, may seem small, but to the lives of those individuals are massive. We will be watching you the planners. We will be watching you, the various environmental protection agencies, because we will demand that you do your job and that you do it to the highest standard. I'm a pretty little man, rubbing my hands, ready to unveil my master plan. The growth of otherwise unprofitable factory pig farms in Northern Ireland is being encouraged by massive financial incentives for anaerobic digesters, ADs, most of which use livestock slurry to make energy. Though the payment scheme is now closed for new ADs, most existing ADs will continue to use livestock slurry and continue to attract payments at a rate four times higher than anywhere else in the UK for 20 years. The scheme is financed by a levy on UK electricity bills, averaging at £200 per household per year. This anaerobic digester near the proposed Limavardi pig factory is only 35 metres away from the nearest home Plus, the AD has no waste management licence, no habitats assessment, no bioaerosol emissions assessment, and the farmer has a pollution conviction for discharge from the site. Because of the way that AD plants operate, if they take slurry, they have to take an equal volume of green uh, energy crops to feed the plants. So we're actually now moving into a situation where we're growing energy crops and using land to feed AD plants and uh, it's been calculated that over 21,000 hectares of land will be required if all the AD plants that are in the planning process are come on stream. Then when we looked into that we discovered that nobody was really controlling that land spreading and it looked as if they could just put it wherever they wanted and then we discovered that the NIA to planning had just written they had no objections. The Northern Ireland Environment Agency has since admitted that they failed to undertake appropriate habitats assessments for AD plants in Northern Ireland. It could be a double-edged sword for some farmers, where somebody has an anaerobic digester and farmers can't afford to feed their animals. There was 179 applications passed in Northern Ireland for AD plants. 69 are in operation. Each of them uh, take probably, through off-gen, we got the figures, £900,000 a year. Multiply that by 69, by 21 years, and you've got £1.3 billion going to investors. Meantime, Northern Ireland, those uh, AD plants have slurry that needs to be spread. So we've got more slurry. London city speculators, attracted by the huge subsidies for renewable energy from anaerobic digester plants, persuaded Raymond Pollock to sell his herd of organic dairy cows and join a scheme whereby he would provide his grass silage and run the AD plant. 
They told us it would take X tons of silage to uh, run the plant. Turned out it takes twice the amount. This planning clearly states it was for a farm based agricultural project. This is no longer the case. I haven't been involved in it now since over a year and a half now going and it's now run from Savile Row in London but from by Assured Energy Limited who developed the plant backed by GCP who are a finance crowd. They are both running this now on a commercial basis. The developers of it uh, haven't complied with all the planning and the uh, environmental issues, health and safety and I've been having running battles with them and it's the biggest mistake I ever made was to build this plant. I cannot understand why the authorities do not take more action to impose the rules and regulations. The, the problem is, the planning was in my name, the authorities have threatened me with prosecution. And so we're here today outside the Environment Agency to say we protest because we have no right of, of appeal in Northern Ireland. We have no right of third party appeal against planning decisions. So that, that's why we're here today, just to let the Environment Agency know that we're protesting against this tyranny. We don't have a minister, we don't have a government. We have civil servants making decisions about our future and they are not listening to us. So today, this is a protest like George Orwell's Animal Farm. It's an end to tyranny. These developments need to be assessed cumulatively. In other words, that if there's a pig farm down the road and there's one three miles away and there's another intensive poultry factory, the emissions from all these developments with other pollutants um, need to be assessed in combination. The Department of Agriculture implemented a derogation from the Nitrates Directive if the developers split projects across multiple sites. So, to avoid a cumulative impact assessment, the 80,000 piglets from the proposed Limavardi pig factory will be transported to over 40 other factories for rearing. As each of these factories will hold under 2,000 pigs, they won't be subject to ammonia thresholds, so they won't need pollution prevention and control permits. A neat little loophole to keep spreading ever more slurry. We don't want 66,000 tonnes of shit every year. And our fields can't take it, our rivers can't take it, and we're not going to take it. And today we're outside DERA headquarters. This is a brand new shiny building where NIEA have gotten into bed with the Department of Agriculture. And together they're going to bring intensive farming into Northern Ireland. How on earth could you have an environment agency under the control of the Department of Agriculture that's promoting programmes like Going for Growth, uh, which is encouraging intensive farming factories. I mean, the two are not compatible in any way. At the minute, the chief executive of the NIEA has admitted to the public the ammonia levels are critical, and yet in his next breath, but we must balance that with the Going for Growth programme. Furthermore, we have 15 pig uh, unit applications. Limit Valley was the biggest one in the United Kingdom and we've just discovered that there's one in Ballyclare which is slightly larger. People are concerned about the value of their properties and, and close proximity to these plants that the, the value will, will drop because of uh, smell and uh, pollution and noise. We get lots of visitors to Northern Ireland who are interested in uh, Game of Thrones uh, and the filming locations are uh, around the, the Lamavadi area. We want them to enjoy that, of course. We don't want them to experience in Northern Ireland, which is sort of dotted with huge industrial plants. We've had small farmers with 30 or 40 acres. The prices will drop, family farms will go, and then it will just come into the hands of those people with factories with vast, or mass production of, of food. It's a bit like the parallel with the large supermarkets who in England and America have wiped out all commercial activity in small towns, left towns uh, with no post office, no bakery, no nothing. Now you can apply the same parallel to this. 
if these things are going to be allowed, and then at the end of the day, who owns them? Probably investors in China or Hong Kong or New York or wherever it is, doesn't matter. So the people of the land of Ireland end up not only living in filth and pollution, but also no ownership, no sense of community, no identity, no reason for protecting it anymore. It's almost like our country being invaded again by foreigners, but using different techniques for acquiring our wealth. Meanwhile on the golf course, a man laughs with his mates. They talk about secrets they buried, make plans to do more of the same. People sometimes hear there's jobs coming, but they don't ask how many jobs are coming. And when we tell them there are three or four jobs and one, you know, some of those are pumping them full of antibiotics and some of them are dragging out dead piglets, then they get it that it's not a, it's not a, you know, good employment. So they're going to be spreading the slurry over 20 square miles. And within that 20 square miles, there are three rivers, all the tributaries, 17 protected sites, and a huge number of people who are living in those areas. As a campaign group, we know there are people up in arms. We would like more people to be up in arms. And that would be, you know, that's part of the work that we're doing, is trying to spread the message. If you look over these beautiful fields, you'll bask in the beauty of all they reveal. But come a bit closer, look at the soil, where they're spreading their mess, where the water it boils. So we're here on a beautiful day at the Balmoral Show. This is the centrepiece of the farming industry in Northern Ireland. It's run by the Ulster Farmers Union. Representative organisations for the farming industry have become closer to the global agri-food business. That is not a future for the landscape, for the countryside, for the wildlife, for the, for the rural economy. It's not a future for farming families either. Although I wrote several times to the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, DERA, they refused to grant me an interview. However, at Balmoral Agricultural Show, I managed to doorstep the Permanent Secretary of DERA and asked him why he's giving out more planning permits to large-scale pig and poultry factories when over 90% of Northern Ireland's protected habitats had already exceeded their critical nitrogen threshold. I quote his reply, the view of the farming industry is that we're saying no too much. And we're in a no-win situation, as we don't have ministers in place, so there's a limit to how much we can do. He went on to say, It's a £4.4 billion industry. It's employing a huge amount of people. It's hugely important to our society and our economy. And actually, it's moving in a very positive direction in a vast majority of cases. So five local people will be employed, which is which is a joke, you know, it's a joke. So there's no, there's no money, there's no money, none of the money staying in the community. You know, not even the meat is staying in the community. The meat's going somewhere else, like the pigs are going somewhere else. So it's not even, it's bringing no worth at all to the community or the local area. They say nothing is eternal, but I say nothing is in vain. I live to love. I'm thankful for the road, the rock and the rain. So this is 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement, which was meant to create a lasting peace in Northern Ireland. And it is as if we've changed the conflict. It's no longer an official conflict between orange and green, between nationalism and unionism. It's as if the conflict now is against nature, it's against the countryside, it's against the very things that unite us, like the land, the air and the water. But the people who are resisting these corporations are also reviving a different type of democracy. It's a grassroots environmental democracy. The choice is between a healthy and abundant rural economy based on fishing, based on family farms, based on good food, healthy food, real food, or an alternative. And that alternative is a spectre and it's called going for growth. I'm hoping that people go into these places and go, you know, why would I want to eat that? 
that is not the way I want to live. I do not want my kids, my family eating stuff that's pumped full of antibiotics. We have no traceability of what is in our meat that we go to a supermarket and buy. We can all help close factory pig farms by only buying meat with a high welfare label like RSPCA, outdoor bread, free range and best of all organic. Either from a supermarket or to avoid the middleman, buy direct from your local farm shop, farmers market or online via a box scheme. There's a rising awareness of animal welfare. Um, I know it might not seem like it sometimes with you know, factory farmers springing up and, and whatnot, but there is, from people we talk to, especially at markets and one-to-one -one with consumers, there is a, a desire for people to know where their pork and their meat comes from. Um, they want provenance, they want to know how it's made. We don't dock tails, we don't clip teeth. We try and keep everything as natural and organic here as possible. We've been going for 20 years, the family farm. So we keep Tamworth pigs completely free range. And when you want to keep pigs outside, you have to realise you have to use traditional breeds. And the commercialisation of farming has created an industry that's meant that people think that chicken and pork and bacon and eggs are cheap. They're not cheap, they shouldn't be cheap. An animal died for that, and if, if it died, then you should pay a good price. People don't realise how hard it is to keep going in this world of supermarkets, which are just pushing down the price of everything. You know, they're destroying their farmers. The farmers are destroying their land because they're having to just overproduce one product to keep it really, really cheap. The whole system just doesn't work. We have to get back to a system where everything's a lot smaller, and people should eat way less meat and way better meat, in my opinion. <laughs> we also need to get active and the first thing we need to do is ensure that a moratorium is imposed immediately on these new intensive factory farms. Second thing we need to do is to ensure that there's no further derogation by the European Union to allow us to pollute even more under the nitrates directive. The third thing we need to do is to ensure that we have a healthy planning system where objectors have the same rights as developers. And that's why we need something called third party rights of appeal in the planning system. We also need to breathe new life in the planning system to ensure that it operates in the public interest, not in the interest of narrow vested corporations. And finally, I think we have an obligation on ourselves as campaigners to promote the idea of high welfare meat, that if we want to eat meat, that we should respect the animal and we should respect the countryside to ensure that the highest environmental standards are imposed. So on an institutional level, right down to the local level, there are so many things that we need to achieve and we will achieve them. Here I stand, ten feet taller than the also rants. The law won't catch me because the law don't care your government's bent. I put them there.